Welcome everyone. I'm Angie Shanick, Manager of New Business Development here at DEMCO. I'm excited to be moderating today's session, Understanding Brain Health as a Pathway to Relevant Adult Programming. Before we get started, there are a few details to review. On your screens, you see a chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or are having any type of technical issue, please use this to communicate with us, and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. We have built-in time at the end of the session for Q&A. Please use the chat box to post your thoughts and questions, and we will compile these to address at the end of the presentation. However, should we run short on time to address all these questions, we do write up answers to all questions and post them along with the recorded webcast after the event, which will be on ideas.demco.com. On your screen, you should also see contact information for myself and Henry Monka, our presenter. Please feel free to email us directly with specific questions we may be able to help with. Today's Twitter hashtag is hashtag Demco Ideas. You should be able to see that hashtag on the side of your screen in the chat box. We are monitoring that feed as well for any questions and comments that you post there. So right off the bat, I'm going to test everyone by asking you to answer a poll question while listening to my introduction of today's presenter. You may find it difficult to divide your attention and fully recall details later of either task. You'll learn more about this from Henry. Our question today is, how would you categorize the utilization of library materials and services by adults in your community? Select all that apply. Moving on to the program, today's webinar is focused on understanding our brain and ways in which we can keep it healthy as we age. Having personally experienced many of the signs of an aging brain, poor recall of names, forgetting details, misplacing things, being more easily distracted, I was relieved to learn that this was normal and even somewhat predictable by those who are much smarter than I. But the real solace came in learning that there are ways and things that I can do to repair this situation. It is our hope that you will take away a better understanding of the connection between our brains to our overall health and well-being, and that this will become a key consideration in your adult program planning. Today's expert and presenter is Dr. Henry Manka. Henry is the CEO of Posit Science, the makers of their top-tier brain training program, Brain HQ. At Posit Science, Dr. Monka, a neuroscientist by training, leads the efforts to design, test, and refine online exercises that effectively address cognitive issues related to healthy aging. He earned his PhD at the University of California, San Francisco. Henry was a co-presenter on a DEMCO-sponsored ALA panel this past summer titled Meeting Needs and Making a Difference, Engaging Adults Through Programming. The panel was well regarded, and we therefore decided to broaden the reach of the content, offering it as two webinars. Henry is presenting the Understanding the Brain content today, and that will be followed by a presentation in October by Julie Actison and Hope Levy, who will be going deeper into the adult programming connection with libraries. Now, for our poll question results. Overwhelmingly, 69% of you say that the adults utilize both physical and virtual services, and about one in, an adults attend between one and three programs a year. So that's pretty good. And also, they're avid users of physical materials. So it sounds like you got a lot of usage overall, and so it's a good place for everybody to start. So with that, Henry, I believe we are ready to turn over the controls to you to get started. Fantastic. Thank you, Angie. So this is Henry Monka talking right now, and Angie, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And as Angie said, I'm going to uh, talk for a bit on this webinar about uh, brain science um, and go on to talk a little bit about brain training for adults and uh, finally wrap up with some thoughts on how this might be relevant to adult programming for libraries. But first, I want to say how excited and what a pleasure it is for me to talk to folks who work at libraries. So I was one of those classic kids who basically grew up in libraries. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I'm out in San Francisco now, but I was an East Coast kid. 
and I spent almost every weekend, almost every afternoon in the Chevy Chase Library, the Bethesda Community Library, one of those places, diving, diving deep into books and everything I can read. And it's really uh, fun for me to have this come full circle and have now put together uh, uh, some brain training programs, which might be helpful and relevant to libraries. So thanks for thanks for coming, and I look forward to your your interest and your questions and what we talk about today. So with that, let me start off here. Oh, as soon as I get my slides to work, there we go. So we're going to talk today about uh, building better brains, and uh, we're going to start off by just some uh, some background and information and some what I hope is interesting and exciting content around how the brain works. And I think the brain is about the most amazing thing that's, uh, that's, that is out there in the universe. And I'm not alone in that fact, actually. Uh, I came to brain science when I was an undergraduate at Rice University, and I'd started off in a major in math and physics. And then about halfway through my undergraduate studies, I realized that um, thinking about the brain was a lot more interesting than thinking about, uh, about calculations and atoms. And I swapped to a neuroscience major, and I liked it so much that I came out here to San Francisco and got a PhD in neuroscience, and then helped found a company involved in making better brains. And uh, I, I'm not the only one who thinks that brains are amazing. The brain has been described as the most complex and interesting creation in the entire known universe. And that's really because it does everything. So when we think about brains, we think about a, a, a three or three and a half pound piece of biological tissue inside your head that's responsible for everything you see, everything you, everything you hear, uh, everything that you uh, touch, everything that you remember, everything that you pay attention to, as this cat is doing to this mouse, and everything that you think about. And when you consider the fact that, that this three pound piece of tissue is capable of creating every aspect of the human experience, from sensation to cognition to emotion, uh, it's astounding uh, what, a, what a piece of equipment this is inside of our head. And understanding how it works becomes all the more interesting. So how does the brain work? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a tip at the beginning of this, which is nobody knows all the details yet, but let's talk a little bit about what we do know, because I think it's fascinating. So I'm going to start off talking just a tiny little bit about brain anatomy, just the least that you need to know to, uh, uh, to talk around how the brain works. So on the left, I'm going to say neuron a few times as I go through this talk, and a neuron is a very specialized brain cell. You probably already know that your entire body, uh, as is true of every animal and plant, is made up of cells. And the brain, in fact, is made up of all kinds of specialized cells, and one of those kinds of specialized cells is called a neuron. And neurons are amazing cells because they talk to each other. Here's the neuron cell body, and uh, cell body, and you may remember the nucleus from your cell biology days. And most neurons have a long connection that lets them transmit electrical information to another neuron. And in fact, when we look at how neurons connect at a location we call the synapse, we see that this elaborate organization of chemicals and receptors that allow neurons to talk to each other. And in fact, each neuron in your brain talks to as many as a thousand other neurons, and they're incredibly specialized. Over here is a beautiful picture showing how incredibly different different neurons can be in your brain. Some of them are like this one shown in figure A, and they fan out like a, like a tree, and others of them, oops, others of them, uh, uh, have all kinds of other different shapes and sizes, and they're all very specialized to do different things. And so with that in mind, uh, where does the brain do its work? And one thing that's amazing about the brain is it's very different than other organs in your body. So let's start off with the liver. The liver is also a pretty amazing organ, and, and of course people study the liver. And one interesting thing about the liver is that uh, every piece of the liver pretty much does what every other piece of the liver does. And what I mean by that is if you were to have an accident and lose a chunk of your liver, the rest of your liver could keep functioning just fine, and in fact would even regenerate over time to replace the piece of your liver that you're missing, your piece of the, your liver that you're missing. So this part over here on the right does just about the same stuff as this part over here on the left. 
And a while ago, scientists used to think that that was true of the brain as well. If you look at a brain, you see this large mass of kind of grayish pink tissue. This one's a little bit more colored than a real brain is. And for a long, long time, uh, back from the time of the ancient Greeks all the way really up to about the 18th century, people thought the brain was like the liver. And they thought that, well, the back part probably does the same thing as the front part, and the top part does the same thing as the bottom part. And one way or the other, all of it does this kind of thinking, attention, emotion stuff. But it turns out that's really not true. And we learned this in a variety of ways, but one of the most interesting ways we learned it was the sad story of a gentleman named Phineas Gage. So Phineas Gage lived several hundred years ago uh, in New England, and in fact he was a railroad engineer. And uh, back at that time, uh, building railroads was uh, uh, quite a, a laborious activity. It involved a lot of handwork and quite a dangerous activity as well. And over here on the left, you see a picture of Phineas Gage, and what he's holding here in his hand is a railroad spike. <clears throat> so this was a spike that was used to, uh, to tamp down and uh, to nail down the rail uh, roads that they were building. And one day, Phineas Gage had an absolutely terrible accident. Uh, what was happening is he was tapping down one of these railroad spikes, and one of his colleagues uh, accidentally set off a dynamite charge earlier than it was supposed to go. And this railroad spike actually went through Phineas Gage's head. Uh, and in fact, amazingly, he didn't die. Uh, you can see a modern reconstruction of this accident here. This is Phineas Gage's skull, and this is how the railroad spike went through. And he lived. Uh, even with the terrible medical care of the 18th century, he lived. And, uh, of course, he was uh, bed-bound for quite a while and then recovered. And, in fact, after he recovered, he went back to work. But people immediately noticed a change in him. And what they noticed was, was that although he was still, uh, still had the name Phineas Gage, as they said, he was no longer the man that he used to be. His temperament had changed. Whereas before the accident, he had been reliable, courteous, and punctual. After the accident, he was the opposite. He was frequently late for work or missed work. He got into fights with people all the time, uh, and he eventually left his family. And it became clear after a while that the reason this had happened is that he had suffered damage to the front part of his brain as a result of this railway spike going through it. And in fact, uh, what people started to realize were that different parts of the brain did different things. And as a result of having this very specific damage to the frontal uh, part of his brain, Phineas Gage's personality had changed. And even though he could still see, and he could still hear, and he could still remember things, he had had some damage essentially to the emotional or the uh, personality portions of his brain. And this, along with uh, a lot of other uh, uh, neurology that began in the late 19th century and early 20th century, sparked a revolution. And we came to understand that the brain is not at all like the liver. The different parts of the brain, in fact, do very different things. And that knowledge has become only more uh, intense and, uh, and deep as we've come into the modern area where we can study things with brain imaging or look very carefully at patients who've had brain damage. So on the left here, this is a, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about an area of the brain called the fusiform face area. And this is a very, very small but very, very specialized portion of the brain. And it turns out that when this gets damaged, as can happen during a stroke or during certain kinds of traumatic brain injury. Every part of the brain works great. Every part of the brain works perfectly, except for one very important feature, which is people who have damage to the fusiform face area can no longer recognize faces. They can recognize the parts of faces. They can know that there's a face there, but they can't figure out who it is, even if it's someone they've known their entire life, like a father or a sister or a spouse. And what that tells us is that the brain is incredibly specialized. All of the work that we, our brain does for face recognition is concentrated in this one tiny area, which can be vulnerable to damage. A similar amazingly specialized area is the right posterior parietal cortex. And you don't have to remember this name, of course, but I mentioned it just to talk about how specialized that it is. And this area, if it's damaged, a person can actually lose the ability to notice anything on their entire left side. So on the right here, sorry, on the left here, these are example of drawings made by a healthy person. And here's a clock, and I'm sorry, this is a bit blurry, but you can see the numbers going on the clock. Here's a drawing of a house. Here's a drawing of a flower. And here's a patient who's had a stroke, and as a result, they've had damage to the right posterior parietal cortex. And when you ask them to draw a clock, they only get halfway through it. And what's interesting is they think they're done. They have no perception that they've missed half the clock. As far as they can tell, the clock looks perfectly fine. And when you ask them to draw a house, they draw the right side of the house and not the left. 
And here they've been asked to draw a flower, and they draw the right side of the flower and not the left. So again, we see a very specialized tiny portion of the brain that's responsible for an incredibly important function. <clears throat> the entire perception and awareness, even, of everything that's going on, on your left-hand side. So the brain is broken up into many, many, many of these very, very specialized areas. And in fact, when we look in more detail in these areas, we find something even more amazing, which is that they're broken into what we call maps of the world. So this was work that was discovered by a Canadian neurologist, uh, Penfield, and he was doing uh, surgeries in people who had epilepsy. And they didn't know a lot about epilepsy at that time, but they knew it was a problem with, uh, with the brain and how uh, neurons communicated and there could be too much electrical communication in the brain, which could lead to uh, seizures. And so what Penfield was doing is he started to stimulate the brain in very, very tiny little pieces to see if he can figure out what was going on with these seizures. And as he did so in people, he found out that there was a map of the body in the brain. So here we're looking at a picture of a brain and this is just a piece of it. This would be the top of the brain in the center, and over here would be the side of the brain around near the ear, and down here would be sort of the center of the brain in the center of the skull. And what Penfield did is he moved his electrode and gave little tiny bits of electrical stimulation all the way along here in a very organized way, and he asked the patient what they noticed. And what the patient noticed was that they could feel as if they were being touched on their body. And most amazingly, there was this incredible organization to it. So first we find the foot, and then the leg, and then the body, and then it goes up the body to the torso and connects to the uh, hand, and there's this enormous part of the brain that represents the hand. And then there's a bit of a jump, and we hop on over here to the face. We find the cheeks and the mouth, and then there's really quite a lot of brain represented to the tongue as well. And so what's interesting about this is that the brain organizes information uh, in exactly the way that information is organized in the world. And what I mean by that is in the real world, of course, your foot is connected to your leg and it's connected to your body and connected to your hand, and that's exactly how the brain is organized and laid out as well. Except the brain does something interesting. It devotes more space or more brain power, one might say, to the parts of your body that, well, do the most work. So Penfield made this uh, kind of terrifying little model, but this represents what the body looks like according to the brain. There's a huge amount of space representing the hands, lots of space representing the mouth and the tongue, but really not much space representing the rest of the body. And that's probably because these are the most important things for our sense of touch. When we're out there in the world, we grab things with our hands and so forth. And you might ask, well, what's all this stuff doing with the mouth? But that's, of course, because we eat. And eating is incredibly important to us and our brains, and so the brain has devoted a lot of brain power to the mouth and the lips around eating. So that's an amazingly complicated and fascinating level of organization to have found in the brain. But if we dig in one level deeper into these maps, we find something that's even more amazing. So if we look at individual neurons in these maps, we find out that individual neurons like very, very specific things. So here's, a, here's one. On the left here, we're now looking at a neuron that's part of the visual part of your brain. And this was a neuron that was discovered by, uh, by two scientists, Hubel and Weasel, in the 50s. And what they did is they put an electrode in and they listened to this neuron. And by listen, what I mean is they recorded its electrical activity. And the electrical activity is shown here. This little graph shows uh, uh, time going along like this. And each one of these vertical lines is what's called a spike of electrical activity. It means the neuron is active and communicating information. And then they showed these very, very little simple images. So what they showed here is a, a red bar, and it's tilted a little bit to the right. And when they move that red bar back and forth, this neuron does nothing. But if they make the bar a little bit more vertical, this neuron responds some. A little bit up and to the left, it responds a lot. And very much up into the left, this neuron loves that. It really wants to see, so to speak, uh, uh, pictures of bars like this tilted up into the left. And of course, as we change the orientation more, the neuron stops being active again. So this neuron prefers something very, very specific, which is to say this particular shape and this particular orientation of a bar. Well, that's kind of interesting, but it gets even more amazing. So later, in the uh, 90s, early, uh, early parts of the 2000s, scientists, again, recording directly from, from people who were awake uh, for surgery for epilepsy, did the same kinds of experiments, except instead of using little uh, bars like this, they used pictures of real people. And what they found was neurons that were specific to very uh, specific individuals. So now here's a neuron that likes Pamela Anderson. 
And uh, many of you may know that Pamela Anderson's a, a very famous uh, uh, Hollywood star of uh, movies and TV shows and so forth. And uh, here we're looking at a neuron, and each one of these little blue lines represents activity from this neuron. And it responds when it sees a pencil drawing of Pamela Anderson, or this picture of Pamela Anderson, or this picture of Pamela Anderson, or it even responds when the word Pamela Anderson is shown to the person, but it doesn't respond to any other person. And when you look at this response pattern, you have to start to think, well, gosh, this is how this person knows when they're seeing the movie star Pamela Anderson. Whenever they see her, this neuron fires like crazy, and it's this neural activity itself that represents the experience, perhaps, of seeing Pamela Anderson. And so we've come an awful long way from uh, 300 years ago when we thought that the brain was all kind of an undifferentiated mass of tissue. And we now see that there's incredible complexity and specialization to this organization of the brain. Different parts of the brain do different things, and then even two neurons that are right next to each other in the brain can prefer and like and do different things. Now, for many people, that maybe naturally leads to the idea of, well, hey, this is how perception works. It feels like there's a little TV inside of our brain. It feels like when we're out there in the world and, I don't know, we see a, an egg on a frying pan, for example, that that image comes in through the world and, it, you know, it hits our eye and it gets translated up to our brain. And I think most people's sense of their own kind of conscious experience is, well, hey, there's like a, it's like there's a little person inside my brain and he's watching a TV that shows what the eye shows. And, and that's how I know that I'm seeing, in this case, an egg in a frying pan. And it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Scientists have spent an enormous amount of time looking for this center in the brain to try and say, well, now that we understand that different parts of the brain do different things, there must be some center in the brain where it all gets brought together. And that must be the center of our conscious experience. And one of the most amazing things we've learned from neuroscience over the past maybe 30 years now is that, in fact, that's not what happens. That although the brain is doing all these different things in all these different parts of itself, there's no place in the brain where all this information comes together as if there's a single center of consciousness. And what that tells us is that our conscious experience must come somehow from all of these different parts of the brain working together in synchrony. So that's a little bit of tour through uh, uh, a little bit of uh, tour through our, our history of learning and understanding something about how the brain works. Uh, and as a neuroscientist, as I talk about that, I, I feel morally obligated to make two other points about how the brain works because these questions come up for me all the time. And as librarians, people maybe ask will you ask you these kinds of questions as well as a as a as a local expert. Uh, and so one question I get is uh, oops, let's get all those lines out of the way is. Well, hey, as we're thinking about how the brain works, and we've understood uh, there are all these different parts of the brain, a question I often get is, well, how much of the brain is really used? Because, of course, there's a very common idea out there that, hey, we only use about 10% of our brain, and that maybe we could get smarter if we could use 20% uh, or 50% of our brain. And if anyone saw the uh, Scarlett Johansson movie last year, Lucy, there was the idea in this movie that she was going to take a drug and it was going to expand her brain use from 10% of her brain to 100% of your brain, at which point apparently she was going to become a, a superhuman spy and uh, largely conquer the world. And although it was a great movie and I enjoyed it very much, the neuroscience was not very accurate because it turns out we use essentially all of our brain. Uh, if you do brain imaging and ask people to do various different kinds of tasks or employ different skills, what you'll see is that the entire brain lights up as we do things. And, uh, you know, when you look back in the history, it's actually a bit, a bit hard to understand where this initial myth came from, that we use only 10% of the brain. Uh, but we really do use all of it, and uh, one of the ways I suppose I can say that is, is that if you were to ask a neuroscientist what part of their brain they'd be willing to lose, um, if they weren't using it all, every neuroscientist would say, well, I'm not willing to lose any of my brain. I'm using all of it. And you should feel the same way about your brain as well, which is why you should wear a helmet while biking, for example. Every single part of it is important and valuable. A second question that comes up sometimes when I'm talking about the brain is, well, does brain size matter? Are bigger brains better than smaller brains? And this idea is out there in popular culture all over the place. Nintendo, the video game company, even had a game called Big Brain Academy where you could take quizzes and watch your brain grow. And in fact, a lot of people have this idea because if you see a picture like here on the lower left, if we look at a mouse brain, well, it's very small. And if we look at a monkey brain, and you know, monkeys are actually pretty smart, 
uh, we see it's bigger, but of course a human brain looks like it's the biggest of all. And so it's easy to look at these pictures and say, well, big brains probably do matter because the human brain is the biggest. However, most people who show you don't these who show these pictures don't show the next picture, which I'll show you. So here's a picture of a human brain compared to a whale brain or an elephant brain. So now the human brain is here in the upper left. This is the brain of a pilot whale. And you can see that, oh gosh, it's almost twice as big as a human brain. And then here's the brain of an elephant. Elephant brains are absolutely enormous. So uh, elephants and pilot whales are no doubt highly intelligent, perhaps in very different ways than ours. But I think looking at these comparisons probably tell us that the absolute size of the brain doesn't matter per se. What matters is how it's organized and what it's doing. And in fact, when we look at human brains, we see you know, some degree of variation with some people having slightly larger brains and some people having slightly smaller brains. But there's never been any clear relationship of that kind of brain size within humans to things like IQ or memory or cognitive function. What almost certainly matters about the brain is not how big it is, but how well it's organized. So with that, let's talk a little bit about brain organization. So we have this incredible thing inside of our head. It has all these amazing abilities that we've talked about. How does this thing get built? It's the single most complicated organizational system in the known universe. And the first thing that I want to say about it, because I think this fact is just amazing, is that there's not enough DNA in your cells to specify and organize the brain. And what I mean by that is often when we think about uh, how systems in our body are built, we turn to DNA and genes. And we say, well, hey, the reason I have blue eyes is I have a certain gene for blue eyes. And the reason some people are taller and some people are shorter is we have genes that control uh, how tall or short we are. And we generally tend to look to DNA to explain the organization and development of the body. However, that's simply not possible for the brain. If we look at a single human cell, we see that it has about three billion base pairs. That's three billion letters, so to speak, that fully describe the human genome. That's every piece of information that we have in our DNA. Now, three billion pieces of information seems like an awful lot until you look at the brain. And when you look at the brain, you see that there's actually over 100 billion neurons in a typical human brain. And of course, each of those neurons tends to connect to 1,000 other neurons. And so there's actually 100 trillion connections in the human brain. And I think you can see, of course, that there's no way that every single one of those neurons and every single one of those connections could ever be specified by DNA. There's just not enough DNA. The DNA has to control it somehow, but it can't lay down a complete wiring pattern for the human brain. So how does the human brain get wired up then? Well, it turns out that the brain builds itself through learning. And this has been, I think, one of the most amazing breakthroughs in understanding in neuroscience over the past 30 years. The brain's not specified like a machine with a blueprint. Instead, what the DNA contains is some instructions about how to learn, and then the brain builds itself through learning. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can look at an example here in rats. And here we're looking at a map. You might remember I showed you a map of the skin before. Now I'm showing you a map of hearing. So if you look inside of a rat brain and look at the part of the brain that's responsible for hearing, when you look at a rat who's just born, you'll see that there's a lot of the brain that responds to sound. And high sounds are shown responding in red. Low sounds, like a bass voice, are shown in responding to blue. And there's quite a lot of it, and there's a little bit of organization, but as we can see from all this kind of a black stippling, the organization is not very precise. It's sort of like a whole bunch of the brain is listening, but it doesn't really know for what. If we look at that brain a little bit later, when, he gets, when a rat gets older, we see that the rat has actually now developed an incredibly precise map of the brain for hearing. So high sounds, you know, your soprano sounds, are over here on the right. In the middle are the mid-range sounds, and on the left are these bass sounds. And in fact, the way that the brain has built itself is through experience. The rat has listened to all kinds of other things. It's listened to rats making their noises. It's listened to humans around it. It's listened to predators. It's listened to its environment. All of that information has come into the rat brain, and the rat brain has organized it into this map. But it turns out you can disrupt this organization in the rat brain. If you take a baby rat and you simply have it grow up and it doesn't get to hear all of this normal information, it just gets to hear a lot of, let's say, radio static, 
you can actually prevent the brain from developing and organizing and building itself, and you'll have a teenager whose brain looks very much like the baby's brain here. And so what that tells us is that interaction with the world, experience, in this case with sounds, is actually what builds the brain. Now, that's pretty interesting. If it turns out that what we do with our brain shapes how our brain gets built going from our uh, being a baby to being a teenager, how about when we're adults? Well, it turns out you can do these same kind of things with rats who are adults and rats who are older adults. So rats turn into senior citizen rats, just like humans turn into senior citizens. And when you look at rats who do that, you see that actually their brains become kind of less precise and more noisy. So again, here we're looking at the part of the rat brain that deals with hearing. And we see now we're looking at a different measure. We're looking essentially at how precise the rat brain is. And blue areas of the brain are very precise. They hear just one and only one thing. Red areas of the brain are not very precise. They kind of respond to everything. So here's an adult rat, and you see she's got a very precise organization to her brain. But then if we look at a rat who's uh, an older adult, the equivalent of a human in their 60s or 70s or 80s, we see that this brain precision measure is much worse. There's many more parts of the rat's brain that are now reddish, which means that they're not very precise. They respond to all kinds of information. So when people in, uh, in, uh, in laboratories at University of California and many other labs around the world looked at this, they wondered to say, well, is there something we can do about this? If the newborn rat hears all kinds of certain sounds and gradually organizes a map, can we build a, a rat brain training program that could help a rat, an older rat, make its brain more precise like a younger rat? And it turns out that's exactly what you can do. The laboratory that I did my PhD work in at the University of California, San Francisco, built rat brain training programs like this, where the rats had to hear and listen to and organize and understand all kinds of different sounds. And when the rats worked hard at this, what we found when we went in and looked at their brains was that they now had brains that were as sharp and precise as a regular adult rat. We could turn back the clock, one might say, in these rat brains. Now, that was fantastic and wonderful. However, there's only so exciting we can all get about making rats smarter. Rats are wonderful little creatures, but we don't really need them to be smarter and faster and have better memories. What we need is humans to be smarter and faster and have better memories. And so what we did is we decided to take this technology out of the laboratory at the University of California and turn it into a company, which uh, my advisor, Dr. Michael Mersnick, founded and called Posit Science. And we took that rat brain training program, which was great for rats, but not so great for people, and we turned it into a human brain training program called Brain HQ. So now I'm going to turn my attention now, and have, having talked a bunch about how the brain works and showed this kind of amazing ability for the brain to organize and change itself, let's talk a little bit about what we can do for people. Well, let's start off with why. Why do we even want to make better brains? Well, it's been pretty well established now, and I think just about everyone knows this from their personal life, that our brains change with age. And in fact, it are, in particular, our cognitive function changes with age. So this is data now from a researcher at the University of Virginia named Tim Salthaus. And what he did is he brought literally thousands of people into his laboratory of all different ages, as young as 22, and in this case, as old as in their late 50s. And he made very careful cognitive function measures, in particular of their memory and their speed. And if we express this on kind of an IQ-like scale, where an average person would get 100, we see some amazing things. We first of all see that cognitive performance seems to peak actually at around the age of 27. And we see this in these graphs, and this has also been very nicely shown in some studies of uh, people who play a lot of video games. They're at their best in their mid-20s. But then after that, cognitive decline starts. And of course, we often think about memory and speed as being a problem of older people, uh, you know, in their 80s or 70s. But in fact, these issues start to emerge in just about everyone, really even in our 30s. And as, of course, we can see as time goes on, we enter a period which has been called the sort of middle age distractibility. People start to notice that they're not quite as fast or as sharp as they used to be. And they often think, well, it's just because I'm really busy now. I have kids. I'm taking care of my parents. But actually, a lot of it is changes in their brain function. And as time goes on, we start to notice senior moments. And in fact, if I was to draw this graph past the age of 57, we'd see that we'd see these changes continue. 
And this is actually important. It's been now very well established that your cognitive function in your middle ages, in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, it actually predicts your resist risk of going on to Alzheimer's disease. So the worse off you are in your middle age here, the more likely that you'll have Alzheimer's disease as you get older. And in fact, lots of people from the National Marketing Institute to AARP have surveyed people and interestingly shown that one of the top concerns of people who are 50 and older is maintaining their mental capacity. And in fact, this concern for people often outranks other concerns like physical health or financial stability. Everyone, just about everyone, wants to be as sharp as where they exactly are right now. Almost no one wants to take cognitive decline sitting down, so to speak. And of course, we're talking about the baby boomer generation here. These are the people who invented the concept of physical fitness. As they started to hit their 30s and 40s and the 70s and 80s, they invented the idea that you know, running was a good activity or we should all have physical fitness programs, and they did that. And now that these people are turning in their 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, they're very interested in applying those concepts of physical fitness to their brains and to cognitive fitness. Well, what can we do? Well, let's start off with a few things. I often talk with this to other doctors, PhDs or MDs or what have you. And when I talk to doctors, invariably they say, well, this is all very nice, Dr. Monka, but it's not going to happen to us. You know, we're, we're scientists and we're physicians. We're incredibly brilliant people. Uh, but it turns out that cognitive decline happens to just about everyone. This is a beautiful study that was done actually in the 70s, and it measured cognitive function. This is percent correct on a memory test, and it measured it in 1,000 doctors, MDs, and 581 people who, and I love this, were called normals. <laughs> and what you can see is that at every age, the doctors were a bit better than the folks who weren't doctors. But of course, you can see that both of these groups, as we look over time, are experiencing cognitive decline on the average. So being a doctor or being in another uh, profession like that doesn't necessarily keep your brain sharp as you get older. A second question I get is about crossword puzzles. Everywhere I go, people ask me, and I say, Henry, you know, I do crossword puzzles. You know, isn't that going to stave off, or isn't that going to protect me, or isn't that going to keep me cognitively sharp? Well, now I have to turn back to some very nice research, again, done by Dr. Tim Salthouse at the University of Virginia. And now he brought in people of all different ages, and he asked them, well, how many crossword puzzles do you do? And he ranked them into people who did a lot of crossword puzzles and people who didn't do very many crossword puzzles or did none. And he looked at their cognitive function again, where an average person on this scale would have a zero in the middle. And of course, younger people were better off than older people, no surprise. But if we look at the average path of change in cognitive function here, we see it's pretty much exactly the same for people who do a lot of crossword puzzles and people who basically don't do any. And that's unfortunate because it would be wonderful if something as simple as crossword puzzles could keep us sharp throughout our lives. But that doesn't seem to be the way the brain works. The brain wants something different in order to stay sharp. Now, I think crossword puzzles are fun. I think they're fantastic. If you like doing them, you absolutely should. But it's probably not helping your brain uh, in quite the way that it would be nice if it did. So in order to understand what to do to truly help brain function, if we want to apply all of that knowledge that we've talked around, around of what scientists have learned about the brain and how it works over the past 40 years, we have to ask a question and say, well, what's the root cause of memory or, or speed problems in the brain? What's really changing in the brain that's causing a person to have worse memory or slower speeds? And it turns out that one of the biggest problems that a brain has as it gets older is it gets noisier as is shown by this noisy radio here. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that it's fascinating. You can take a young person and you can give them the memory of an old person in a very simple way. If you take a young person and read them a list of 15 words and ask them to repeat them back, a sharp, fast young person might be able to remember, oh, I don't know, let's say 12 or 13 of those 15 words. That would be a pretty good memory score in a young person. But if you do that same test, and you put on a loud background noise while the person is hearing those words to remember. You put on a loud radio or, or you do the test in a restaurant where the person can't hear very well. They're not going to remember 12 or 13 words anymore. They're going to remember five or six or seven, just the way they would if they were in, let's say, their 70s or 80s. And so with that very simple thing, simply by adding some noise to the environment, we can take a young person's good memory and make it into a worse memory. 
And that tells us something very revealing around what's going on in the brain. And it turns out that when scientists look more carefully at what's going on in the brain, whether it's in older rats or older monkeys and older people, you see that the brain itself has become noisier. It's become more messy, so to speak. It's become less precise. And that's almost certainly why these speed and memory problems are emerging, because the actual machinery of the brain is noisier now. It simply can't process information that's coming in as well, whether it's something a person hears or a person, something that a person sees. It has to overcome that noise. And that led us to an idea as we were thinking about building brain training programs. What if we could take that noise out? What if we could build brain training programs, like the ones we built for those rats, and it would speed up and make information processing in the brain more accurate. If we gave a person a faster, more accurate brain with these kinds of training techniques, would they then go on to have better memory or better speed? And so that's what we've done, is we've built a set of brain exercises on those principles. Now, it's difficult on a webinar to show you the ones that involve hearing and noise like this, but I can show you a little bit around some of the exercises that involve seeing. And the same kind of issues are true in the visual system as are true in the hearing system. So here's an example exercise. If you look at your screen now, you should see a whole bunch of birds. And they're arranged in a ring here. And probably pretty quickly you notice that one of these birds is different. This one has a black tail and a black head and a different colored body. So we built a, an exercise which was designed to make your vision faster and more accurate. And the way this exercise works is you're going to be shown this ring of birds very briefly. I'll do it as fast as I can on a webinar, which isn't going to be all that fast, but a little bit fast still. All these birds are going to disappear. I'm going to show you a brief ring of birds and then try and notice uh, where the different bird is. So we'll start off with a blank screen like this. I'll give the webinar a moment. And then very fast, as fast as I can, I'm going to flash a different ring of birds and try and notice where that bird who's different is. Here we go. Okay, this is always a little bit tricky on a webinar, but hopefully if it's working, all of you, or at least many of you, saw a ring of birds, again, around here in the screen, and one of them was different. Now, I'd ask for a show of hands, but unfortunately I can't see you, and so just look at the screen for a moment and try and remember where that bird was. And now I'll show you the answer. The bird who was different was down here in the lower left. Now, to do this task correctly, the visual system needs to start after uh, operating quickly, because we showed the birds only briefly, and accurately, because it has to accurately tell the difference between two very similar birds here. And we can take this task, and we can start it off very slow and easy, so almost any visual system can notice the difference in the birds and give the correct answer. And then as a person gets it right, we can make it faster and faster, and then if we make it too fast, we can have the computer back off the speed and make it slower again. And what we can do is we can find the optimal speed for any person, whether they're a, a young, sharp person, whether they're an old, sharp person, whether they're a, a person who started to experience some cognitive slowing. The computer can always find exactly the right speed for that right person. And by practicing at this task, then, we can make the brain faster and more accurate. And of course, as we do it, we change other things as well. So now the birds are further out in your peripheral visual system, so we can train all parts of the, of the visual field. We can make the birds harder to discriminate, so this bird is different than this one. You see his brown wings, but these birds are much more similar. We can also introduce background elements, so the visual system has to work harder to notice those birds. And in fact, we can make those background elements like this jungle seem very demanding. So it actually takes quite a while for just about anyone to notice that up here in the upper right is the bird who's now different because it's so hard to notice these birds against their background scene. And so by training the visual system with all of these kinds of birds and all of these places, we can make the whole visual system faster and more accurate. And this is one example of a visual training exercise, but we've built dozens of these exercises that work on the visual system, the hearing system, that work on memory, attention, speed, even things like navigation or people skills. And they all work on these principles. So, do they work? Well, that's a great question. And when we founded Posit Science and built these exercises, we wanted to run large-scale clinical trials, just like you would see for a drug or a new medical device, to show that they worked. So we ran a study in collaboration with Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and the University of Southern California, and we studied 487 people in this study. Half of them did those kinds of brain training exercises, and the other half of them uh, actually took like adult education material. So they watched things like uh, 
uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos and took quizzes on them. And we like this comparison because both groups are learning something, but they're learning in very different ways. And what we saw is that if we measured them in the beginning of training and then at the end of training, we saw dramatic differences. So if we looked at how fast their brains were, here's the group that did the brain training exercises and here's the control group that did the educational DVD exercises. We could make the brains of people much faster. And here a lower score is better, represents a faster brain. At the beginning of training, the two groups, the brain training group and the control group, are about the equivalent speed. And then after training, we make this group much faster, and the control group really doesn't change at all. And in fact, we make them faster by an amount that actually means these people are about as fast as people in their 30s and 40s. These are all people in their 60s and 70s, and we can make them as fast as people in their 30s and 40s after training. So that's cool, but what we really care about is do they exhibit generalized cognitive function improvements, and they do. Over here, we're now looking at memory scores, the way a neurologist or a psychologist would measure memory. And again, if we look at them before training in the green bars, we see that they're pretty similar. Uh, and then if we look at after training, we see that the Brain HQ group has improved by about four points on this memory scale, and the control group only by about one point. So the memory improvements are four times bigger in the brain training group than they are in the control group and that effect was highly significant, and that's about the equivalent of 10 years of cognitive function. People in their 70s performed more like people in their 60s, and so forth and so on. And then finally, we asked people with a questionnaire, well, do you notice the difference in your life? We asked them questions like, can you hear well in a noisy restaurant, or can you remember the names of people that you meet? And here, lower scores are better, and again, we see this beautiful improvement in the brain training group, and, and no change, or if anything, a slight worsening at the control group. So this kind of brain training made people's brains faster, it improved their memory, and the effects were big enough that they noticed them in their everyday life. <clears throat> this was a beautiful result. It was actually the first study that had ever been done of a cognitive training program like this. Published this in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society several years ago with, uh, with great excitement. I think I'm going to skip this slide because I see I'm gone a little bit long and show this one to say, hey, as well as changing things like measures of memory and speed, we've actually done brain imaging experiments and show that we're literally changing the organization of the brain. So over here on the left, what you'll see is that these are brain images done with magnetic resonance imaging. This is an image of the brain from the side, and this red area here represents areas of the brain that are better connected now after doing this kind of brain training. And we see that there's this beautiful improvement in connectivity, in this case between the parts of the brain that are involved in seeing and the parts of the brain down here that are involved in attention and memory. And we see here the same brain, except now we're looking from the top, and we see that these changes are happening on both sides of the brain and may even relate to areas that connect the two sides of the brain to help the brain work together and synchrony better. So the way we're improving memory here is by literally changing the wiring and the organization of the brain. And then we did these experiments first with older people, but more recently we've been doing them with people of all ages, and we found something that was so amazing to me that I actually lost a bet on this front. So we did these experiments, I bet that these learning effects would be bigger in older people than younger people, because I figured, well, older people have more room to improve. But it turns out I was wrong. And of course, in science, it's actually quite wonderful to be wrong, because it usually means you've learned something new when you're wrong. So here we're looking at data from tens of thousands of people that have done our online brain training exercises. And we're looking at two different exercises here. This one says UFOV, this is a speed measure. And this one says MOT, this is actually a measure of attention. <clears throat> and what we're looking at here is the red dots show the person's score before training, and the blue dots show their score after training. So on this measure, lower is better, and we see that at every age people improved, and in fact the amount that they improved was remarkably consistent across age. And the attention measure here, higher is better, again, at every age people improved. And that makes us think that this kind of improvement in brain training, it's a lot like physical exercise. Almost all of us can gain benefit from physical exercise, whether it's, uh, you know, we're very heavy and we need to lose weight or improve our cholesterol, but even physically fit people uh, exercise to improve their fitness. And it looks like that's true for brain training as well. This is something that can help make just about everyone sharper, regardless of their age. So, to uh, start to wrap up here, we can actually put this to work in a library now. 
So about two years ago, Demco approached us and said, well, you've built this amazing brain training program. You know, how would you like to make it available to all kinds of people through public libraries? And we jumped at the chance. As I said, I was raised in libraries, and the idea of making brain training something that libraries could do for adult services was really exciting to me. And so Demco has now built out a model where a library can offer Brain HQ to, um, to your patrons. Brain HQ offers about 27 exercises with hundreds and hundreds of levels of training across six different cognitive areas. And we can set this up, and, and Angie can say a bit more about this, so that essentially you can give a brain training license uh, to your patrons, just like you'd loan them an electronic book, I suppose. And they have access to private training dashboards. Each person gets their data and nobody else's. And then you as a library can actually see aggregate measures of utilization to see who's using it and how much. And people can actually train on their own, on their own computer or their iPad or so forth or it's possible actually to organize um, uh, this kind of training so that people come into your library and use your computers, if that makes sense. Angie, did you want to say a few words here, or should I keep going? Oh, in the interest of time, why don't you keep going, and I can address some of the other programming with the follow-up resources. Super. So that takes me to my last slide here, and this is, uh, this is my feet on a soapbox. And the reason I get up on a soapbox here at the end of a talk is because um, this is an incredibly exciting time to be a neuroscientist. And people have spent 40 years understanding this basic science of the brain, what it does and how it works. And we're finally now able to build kind of these kinds of tools that really help people. And uh, I think in a way we're just emerging from the dark ages of brain science. And I think that as in the future, whether it's five years or 10 years or 50 years from now, we're going to look back onto this time in 2015 and we're going to be kind of amazed that we let people get older and didn't give them structured things to do to keep their brains sharp. And we're going to be kind of amazed that we had soldiers who came back from the war with conditions like PTSD or head injury, and we didn't give them very specific tailored brain training programs to help fix and reverse what has happened to their brains under these terrible conditions. And we're going to be amazed that kids in school uh, as well as having their reg regular education programs. We'd be amazed that we didn't give them specific things to help sharpen and organize their brains to get them ready for learning. So I, I hope that, uh, that it, as, uh, as all of these scientific changes happen, you'll have the opportunity to look back today on this webinar and think, oh yes, that's the time where I first started to hear around these amazing ways that we could change and sharpen our brains and, and hopefully over time get them out to just about every person who might want or might need to, uh, to help improve their brains and in that sense really help put this amazing science and help it take it out of the laboratory and help put it out into the world where it can really help people. And I think that libraries have an absolutely amazing and essential role uh, given your connection to the communities and the fact that we can uh, put, it in, uh, put it in your library patrons' hands uh, just in the same way that they would check out a book. So it's a very exciting time for me and, and I hope a very exciting time for you as well. And then I'll end just by saying that uh, if you'd like to learn more about anything that I've talked about, one of the great things about neuroscience is there's fantastic books around neuroscience these days. Everything from the story of Phineas Gage, uh, which I told you at the beginning, to books that talk about how the brain is organized for visual perception, to books about brain plasticity, cortical maps, and in fact even a book by our co-founder Mike Mersnick called Soft Wired where he talks about the things that I've talked around today, how the brain organizes and can change in a great deal of depth. So I, I hope that if any of this has been interesting, you might take the opportunity in your own libraries to, uh, to take a look at these books and learn more. And so with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hen, or yes, thank you. A um, couple of questions that have come in, and in the interest of time, I think we have time for one question. So um, this may be an opportunity for you to get a little bit back on your soapbox, but, um, and also to add a little bit of clarity, I think, in this emerging field. One of the questions that came in is, what is the difference pre between brain games and brain exercises? Sure, that's a great question, of course, and we hear so much about great brain games now. You know, for me, a brain game is anything that involves your memory, your attention, and your speed. And so when I think of that, I think of things like Monopoly or a brain game. You know, you have to plan and you have to think in order to do it. All kinds of video games are brain games in that way. The difference between brain games and brain training is that brain training has been specifically designed not just to engage 
your attention or your memory, but specifically designed to change and improve your cognitive skills and has been shown to work in these kinds of large-scale clinical trials like the ones I mentioned. So what I mean by that is if we want to call something brain training, if we want to tell people, hey, this is a structured program of activity that's actually going to sharpen your cognitive skills, uh, it should have been through uh, a clinical trial to collect the evidence that really shows that it works. And that's the difference between something like uh, Brain HQ, which I talked about. That's the difference between Brain HQ and Monopoly, for example, or Tetris. And in fact, it's the difference between Brain HQ and quite a number of commercial programs, many of which you may have seen advertised on TV or other places. If they don't talk about the evidence that shows that they work, what that means is they don't have evidence that they work. And in that sense, they're more like brain games. They should probably be free and be for fun. All so right. Question, Angie? Yes, I think we can get one more here. And uh, this one just came in. And uh, it is a question about uh, doing physical exercise while learning new things and playing games on the Wii or Guitar Hero or Dance Dance Revolution. And how does that? affect or does it affect and improve the brain function? Yeah, I'm going to break that into two questions if I might. The first question is, hey, what's just the activity of physical exercise on the brain? Because there's been a lot of interest in this. There are some studies that have shown that if you do intense aerobic exercise, the way you do at a gym on a Stairmaster, for example, that, that improved blood flow can actually release growth factors that improve your brain function. There have been some very nice studies that pointed that in direction. However, there also have been some studies that have said, you know, unfortunately mild exercise doesn't do it. Uh, you know, occasionally I see the advice, hey, just go out for a walk. That'll be good for your brain. And going out for a walk is fantastic. I, I do it as much as I can. But that kind of mild exercise probably isn't intense enough to stimulate brain function. And then I think more precisely what you were exactly asking was, well, how about if I do intense physical exercise together with cognitive training? So systems like the Wii where I move around and sweat while my brain is doing something or, you know, can I do Brain HQ while I'm on the Stairmaster and tie it all together? There's a lot to like about that because I think both brain training and physical training, I think they actually help improve brain function in similar ways with growth factors and brain reorganization. And so if you have the physical and cognitive skills to do that, Wow, first of all, I salute you uh, and be my guest. Uh, I think that for most people, unfortunately, in order to get the most out of either activity, they require our full attention and engagement. So when I'm on the Stairmaster, for example, I unfortunately can't imagine doing any brain training. And as much fun as the Wii is, and, and I do have one at home, I play with my kids all the time, there unfortunately have not been very good studies yet showing that that actually improves brain function per se. I think that the Wii is great for balance, for example, and movement, and I think it should be recommended to all kinds of people who are maybe a little bit sedentary and need to move around a bit more. But its effects on brain function really haven't been shown yet at this point. So I think it's a, a fantastic topic for, for research, and uh, I look forward to learning more as we and various collaborators do work in that area. Great. Thank you, Henry. Um, I do need to wrap up here, but I also want to address one other kind of theme that's come in through the questions, um, and that is one of patron privacy. And um, the, the training and the way Brain HQ is structured, the training of the individual patron is private to them, and um, we can go into that in greater detail in the Q&A follow-up that we post uh, in the in the followed up to the session. Um, so I just want to address that very quickly. Um, and the other reporting that was referred to, it is aggregate. So there's nothing that is specific to the individual that that anybody at the library would see. So um, again, this is all private and confidential to the individual. Um, so as we wrap things up, again, Henry, thank you for sharing your expertise and helping us all understand the important connection between our brains and general health and well-being. We do have a brief survey that all the attendees will receive shortly, and we would greatly appreciate it if everybody would take a few minutes to fill this out and let us know how we did. We welcome comments and criticisms and ideas of other topics of interest that you would like to hear about. Um, as we do use this to shape our program offering. 
Tomorrow, everybody will receive an email with a link to this webcast presentation so you can view it again and share it with your colleagues. And then next week, there will be a second email with additional resources, including the slides and that Q&A log of uh, information that we referenced earlier. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate you giving us the time. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there is a second part to this series that will happen on October 20th, and that is the session focusing more on the adult programming that will be presented by Julie Eftison of the King County Library System and Hope Levy, who is a consultant and educator and does uh, a lot of community partnership and program delivery with San Francisco Public Library. And that webinar is entitled Engaging Adults Through Programming. If you are unable to join us for that session on that date, you can also view it on demand if you register. And if you bookmark ideas.demco.com, you are able to see our full webinar schedule, view other on-demand webinars that have already been delivered, and review articles and blog posts. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon.